This is the Justice Fighter Podcast. Justice Fighter Podcast. With Attorney Gerald Griggs. Attorney G. Where we have conversations on social justice, civil rights, and political news that affects us all. It affects us all. Let Attorney Griggs put you on game. Only on the Justice Fighter Podcast, y'all. What's going on, y'all? It's Attorney Gerald Griggs on the Justice Fighter Podcast here on the Justice Media Network. And I am truly honored to have my next guest. She really needs no introduction. I mean, if you've been around the movement for any amount of time, you've seen her viral videos, you've seen her on the front lines. She is what I call the modern day Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, Kimberly Latrice Ooh. Jones, I'm just honored for you to be on Justice Fighter Podcast. Introduce yourself to the people. Hello, everyone. First of all, let me just say I am honored to be here with the Justice Fighter, Gerald Griggs. Um, I am Kimberly Latrice Jones. I am a frontline activist, author. I um, I work with several organizations, the Revolution, uh, Revolutionary Healing, the People's Uprising, Georgia Entertainment Caucus, um, and really just Overall, I'm trying to do work, even as a writer, when I'm writing books, I'm trying to do work to elevate and push the needle on our, for our people. And we thoroughly appreciate all the work you've been doing. We've known each other for a while, but it's crazy that we actually knew each other before we knew each other. So you posted exactly. some on social media the other day about being at the Women's March uh, back in 2017. And I think I responded, I didn't know you were at the Women's March. Tell us about <laughs> how we ended up in in uh, movement circles together even before we met. I think, you know what, I think part of it is that you and I both who are people who, um, <clears throat> people will push to the forward because we're both good orators. Um, and so people like to hear us speak. They also know that we're thoughtful orators. You know, when we're talking about something, we've thought about it, we've vetted that information in our mind. But it's we're also both, I think we have a shared experience in that we both don't need to be the center of attention, that it's not about that for us. So sometimes if I'm in this space and it's it's I'm just supposed to be there in support, I'm just there in support. I'm not trying to make myself known. I'm not like I'm here in case y'all didn't know. Um, you know, I'm just I'm just there to do the work. And I think you're similar in that way. Uh, we do get dragged to the front for a, a lot, but for the most part, we're like, I'm here to do the work. Now, if you want me to speak and that's how you want me to contribute, that's great. If you don't, I'm happy to march and carry my flag and my sign and just add to the numbers and add to the conversation and add to the moment. And it's funny because now I go back and I find all these videos, moments and events, pictures when we were together. Exactly. It's crazy. It's crazy. But I think you, <laughs> I think you're right. I mean, I think in this movement space, we've been moving uh, so much just because we see an injustice or we see something that needs to be called out that we're in these spaces. But I'm honored to call you a sister and, and sure. just just inspired by the work. And I want to talk about one one piece that you did in the middle of the George Floyd um, uprising here in Atlanta. Uh, I think many people saw the video uh, that you did. What inspired you to basically give um, the the video oratory of the feeling of the community at that point? Yeah, it's funny because a, a, a friend of mine had, he's a, he's a documentarian and he had been down recording all of what was going on ever from the top of the civil unrest on. He was out there every day with his cameras and he hit me one day and he's like, yeah, I've been out here at the protest. I'm like, yeah, I've been out at the protest too. What you been doing? He's like, I've been filming. I'm like, well, I've been getting shot with rubber bullets. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so he was like, one day he called me and he said, listen, it was right after there was some rioting and looting downtown. And he called me and he said, I'm out here, I'm doing some filming. Um, can you come do some man on the street for me? So basically he was asking me if I could come out and you know interview people for him. And it was still early in the day. Mm -hmm. At that point, we ended up going to some protests and stuff later. But he said, can you come out here and, and interview some people for me? Since you've been in the thick of it, I think you'll know which questions to ask. And I said, sure. So I got there. It was early in the afternoon. It was maybe like one o'clock. And I started interviewing people and people were downtown cleaning up. 
a lot of black people downtown cleaning up and they had paid for their own supplies. Mm -hmm. Um, They had stuff to get the graffiti off the wall. They were boarding up windows. They had trash bags picking stuff up. And none none of these people worked for the city or anything like that. They were just down there cleaning up. Then it struck me like it ain't a whole lot of like residential real estate around here. <laughs> so this ain't y'all's neighborhood. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And so I started talking to them and these were black people. And every single one of them, when I interviewed them and talked to them and asked them why they were downtown cleaning up the narrative that they went, what they went into was that they didn't want people to think that all black people were like the looters and that they didn't want the narrative to get switched from what was important to the looting. I had I had a flashback moment in my mind mm-hmm. because I thought about the fact that just maybe like a, maybe eight or nine months prior to that, I had put together a cleanup on the west side over um, off old Simpson Road. They don't call it, what, what, it ain't Simpson Road no more. What is it now? Joseph uh, Boone. Joseph Boo. Okay. So it is on Joseph Boo. If you know my mind is still Simpson Road. Mm-hmm. It's Simpson I'm Road. Glad yeah. it's, I'm glad it's Joseph Boo. But um I, I did a cleanup off, off Joseph Boone and I had I had gotten all this stuff donated, dumpsters, all this stuff. And I had like less than I had about a half a dozen people show up to help me clean up. Mm-hmm. And so in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, I can't get people to come out and help me clean up our own community yet y'all are down here cleaning up a community where y'all don't own nothing where y'all don't want own nothing because you are concerned about the gaze of your oppressor Mm. and to be honest Griggs it just really made me mad it just really made me mad and I started talking and I said a few things and David who was standing next to me was like, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on, let me grab my camera real quick. <laughs> yeah. um, and he grabbed his camera and he started recording me and I just kept talking. And that little bit over six minute video is what came out because honestly, and, I, and I'm sure people saw in the, the video that I was emotional, that I was crying, that I was upset, that I went from being calm to being angry because the more I thought about the atrocities that my people had faced, that in this moment, what I was watching was people value property over lives. I was like, maybe y'all don't understand the true story. Maybe y'all don't get the real history of what's happening here. Maybe y'all don't know what really got us to this point. Maybe you don't know why, why why King said that riots were the language of the unheard. Maybe you, maybe you, are participating in the same deaf ears that caused us to get here. And that's what happened. Yeah. And for those that haven't seen it, just go ahead and Google uh, Kimberly Latrice Jones um, viral moment during the George Floyd uh, protest. I'll put the clip in, in for Justify the Media uh, and Justify the Podcast for you guys to listen. But it was it was truly powerful in how she talked about the, the, the death and destruction that's happening in our community at the hands of uh, state sanctioned violence and, and the, the lack of real value there. And so I, I thoroughly understood where you were coming from. I think millions upon millions of Americans as, as well as others from around the world heard you very loud and clear as the clarion voice of the African-American community. And, and I can say as one of the organizers with Queen Yanajaha and several others of the Thursday protests and the Friday protests um, in Atlanta, uh, we appreciate you giving voice to why thousands of people were in the streets protesting for George Floyd, but ultimately for all of the victims in Atlanta uh, that have gone unnamed. And so that summer, it just continued to balloon until we got to Rayshard Brooks. And mm-hmm. so you are part of, of that um, moment of organizing and protest, which led into the birth of the People's Uprising. Kind of mm-hmm. tell us what caused you to, to continue to have that flame burning and wanting to organize here in Atlanta for Rayshard. Well, one of the things, you know, it's at home, so it hurts because it's like, you know, I have a, I have a 16-year-old son. 
my son could have been at that Wendy's at the wrong moment, at the wrong time, in the wrong situation. You know, I have a 16 year old son that's six foot one, that although I know he's a baby, he don't look like a baby to people. He looked like a grown man. And we know that we handle black children. We adultify black children. We handle them as a lot older than they are. So that that hit me, that one hit me really hard because it was up the street from my house. <laughs> it's like down the street from my house. And so I, I when you go back and you watch videos of Richard, now he's such a sweet natured person. He's such a sweet natured person. And even in watching that video, what you really watched was, was a man trying to reason with nonsense until he got tired of reasoning with nonsense. I mean, the length of that video is embarrassing. The amount of time that that was almost like water, like verbal waterboarding, if you ask me, like everybody is going to start to get anxious, tired, reactionary. If you hold them that long, interrogating them for what? For literally doing the right thing. If I'm intoxicated and I have pulled my car over so that I'm no longer a danger to people in the streets driving intoxicated, Please explain to me why that should end in my death. Yeah. That should not end in my death. My kids, his kids shouldn't have woke up the next day without their father. His wife shouldn't have woke up the next day without her husband. His sister shouldn't have woke up the next day without her brother. Like, that's ridiculous to me. And so I have been in the streets as an organizer and as an activist for a while. But honestly, what happened um, after Ray Shard and when I when, when I joined TPU and, and started to participate more with other organizations is that for the first time in years of being in the streets of organizing and fighting for the first time in a long time, I felt like people might actually be listening now. Absolutely. That I was no longer yelling at the wind. Absolutely. Which is how I had started to feel. Yeah. And I, I felt that way as well. And I think you know, unfortunately, it took the loss of our dear brother George and, and, our, and our brother Ray Shard and, and several, several others for us to fully get the rest of the community to understand the urgency, the fierce urgency of now. And, and I think that it was important for the birth of the, the People's Uprising um, to kind of give voice to what, you know, millions of unheard Georgians, but particularly thousands of Atlantans were, were, were thinking in that moment. So I appreciate your leadership uh, with that, as well as your, your, your sisterhood ship with me on that. Cause you know, we, we had been in the streets for such a long time and it, it felt like, you know, for me, it felt for a long time, it felt like I was born in the wrong generation. You know, I would have loved to have been with Dr. King and, and all <laughs> of the civil rights organi organizers of that generation. It just felt yeah. like we had missed that time. And then of course, with the rise of, 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 of uh, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and, and the call uh, for justice, and, and then of course the resistance, it just kind of said this was the right time. And so I appreciate, you know, you giving voice to that. Um, I mean, you are a prolific writer. <laughs> um, I don't think people fully appreciate your scholarship. Um, how can people get connected to your writings and connect with you um, as it seems like you are the the poet laureate of this day and we want to <laughs> appreciate you now so how can people you know get get your writings and, and connect with you on that well you know i have links to to all of my books on my website and my website is just kimjoneswrites.com and um anything that i've written in terms of books i need to update it and add all of my op-eds because i've written for like time magazine and marie claire and um, places like that. So I need to add those op-eds to the list, but um, all of my books are on my website. And it's funny, I have, to, I have to remind you of something you probably don't even remember you said. I remember after my first book um, came out, me and you were, we were sitting somewhere and I had just, um, my second book was getting ready to come out and I had just sold my third book. They had announced that my third book was coming out. And there were a lot of people um, talking about that on the internet and who were saying things like, 
oh, I thought she was a social justice fighter. Now she's writing books, you know, in a very negative way. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting across from you, we were at a lunch or something talking about that. And I was telling you about all these people talking about how, you know, I done sold out because I'm writing books. And I'm like, but I've been writing books for years. I've been a writer writing magazine articles about abolitionist work, about social justice work, you know, for the past 10 years. And you looked across at me and you said, if you don't write it, who's going to tell the truth? It's absolutely true. That's so true. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have platforms like this so people can get a full scope of who we really are. We aren't just people that just magically jumped on the front lines uh, because there was a viral case. We've been doing this right. for such a long time. And that's why I think people should um, tap in to your writings and, and understand the scope, the very scope of your work. So uh, I, I appreciate you and I, I want to give you your flowers now. Um, for I that. that and I feel like we need more frontline writers really yes. I feel I like I'm like I can't, look, it's like about you know a handful of us me and Angie Thomas and a few other people and I'm like listen we, we can't carry the burden by ourselves now like you know people forget Malcolm X wrote books and yes Dr. King wrote books and you know um and you know Ambassador Young that they, they were all writers yes and they had to but get it out and they writers. had to and, and the thing that people don't understand about writing is we are writing about where we are for the next generation to understand the philosophy that they have to carry forward. So, yes, Dr. King was a prolific writer. Malcolm was a prolific writer. John Lewis is a prolific writer, was a prolific writer. Andy is a prolific writer. You need to pick up all of these so you can learn firsthand from the organizers and activists of the past so we can carry that forward. One of the best books I've ever written, uh, read was Dr. Benjamin Lafayette's book about the freedom schools and about how you learn in this process or reading Fred Gray's book on how you put together the litigation that changed the course of history. So these are books that people need to, to read so you understand the mind of these activists. You know, the, the, one of the great things that Dr. King was great at was chronicling his own journey so you yeah. can understand what he was thinking in that moment so i applaud you people have told me i need to write i don't think i'm that great a writer but i i do understand you need to write the need <laughs> to chronicle so yes. I, I appreciate you even for that you write it, yeah even if you write it journal style and it's funny because my new book how we can win which is an extension of the video mm -hmm. um so one of the things that i said we need to do is go back and look at what missteps were made during reconstruction so yes. i really wanted to really wanted to study reconstruction well guess whose reconstruction book i picked up w.e.b du bois because he lived it nice because he That's lived awesome. it and i was yeah and he has a book called reconstruction about his participation in reconstruction work work with it what fell apart with it what the what the organizers was supposed to do and didn't do and all of that and the book is thick it's a big book but i went back and i read reconstruction from his perspective and it was mind-boggling to me because i had read reconstruction books from people of this era who had written about that era but it was totally different reading his words because mm -hmm. he was living it when he was writing it. absolutely absolutely and that that reminds me of a book that i think everybody should read called the third reconstruction written by Reverend Dr. William Barber, which kind of ties into the fact that we are in a third reconstruction. And mm -hmm. so when we start talking about the historical time period that we're in, you can find yourself, your grounding and understanding where you fit in this movement. So that, that's an awesome segue into some uh, definitely needed reading material, which is one of the things that you do all the time on your social media. So I would love for you to share a, a few of the books that you think our listenership should be engaged in actively reading and why? Um, well, first of all, I definitely think that everybody needs to pick up, especially, and I'll say this specifically to, to our allies, right? To people who want to um, be allies in this segment, they should be reading Layla Saad's book, um, Me and White Supremacy. And basically what she does is she basically lays it out for allies to say, if you really want to be in the fight, the most revolutionary thing you could do first is fix yourself. 
do the work to fix your own view, your own scope, combat your own inner prejudice that is, you know, has happened organically just by living in this nation. And she actually has a corresponding workbook that you can order with it as well to sit down and start grappling with your own implicit bias that grows organically in this nation. Um, and she wrote the book a few years ago. She has a she's an amazing podcast um, where she continues to do that work. But I think her work is very I think her work is very powerful because racism is not something that marginalized people created. Um, marginalized people really should be in a position where we are getting on with fixing our communities and getting on with our lives because really it is our white allies who should be fixed fixing the systemic problems of the legal system um, and of the corporate system, because this is a problem y'all created. So it's the problem y'all need to fix. And then we should be really in the business of you know, repairing our communities from the rubble. And, and she deals with that very heavy handedly in her book. And I think it's amazing. And I think all allies should go grab Layla's book. Her name's Layla Saad, um, L-A-Y-L-A, -L -A -L -A, and her last name is S-A-A-D. Is an absolutely amazing book and everybody should read it. But I also think there are books that we could be putting in the hands of young people that are not very heavy handed, but introduce um, the conversations and allow for us, because Frederick Douglass said he 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 he'd rather deal with with building better children than handling broken men. Absolutely. And so we we yeah, and so we need to start putting books in the hands of our young adults who are interested in these conversations, who are interested in this movement. When you know, when we on the front lines, you, we see 14, 15, 16, 17, you know, 20 year olds, 21 year olds, 22 year olds, and there are books that are being directed to them in a fictionalized way, but that is participating in these conversations. I mean, one that we all know is The Hate You Give mm -hmm. um, by Angie Thomas, which became a movie, but you know, you, we all know you never judge a book by its movie. Um, the movie was great, but the book has a lot more detail and a lot you know, more richer conversations um, in it. There is also the author E.B. Zaboy. Um, her name is spelled I-B-I-Z-O-B-O-I. -I -I, and E.B. writes some prolific stuff. She actually just co-authored a book for young people um, with Dr. Youssef Salam, which is loosely based on his experience of being one of the exonerated five. Um, and so there's these amazing authors who are also writing things for our young people that we could be using in book clubs and Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts to enter them into these conversations. That's awesome. And uh, shout out to our brother Yusuf Salam, uh, Zonerated Five, great friend of ours. Um, and so we just need to make sure we instill in this, not only in our allies and our young people, but also in ourselves and continue to grow in our, our intellect and our understanding of the world uh, that's around us and not so much just consuming mainstream media, but also going deeper into our continued education. Cause you know, a lot of my mentors always told me, Gerald, the day that you stop learning is the day that you die. Uh, so I think that it's important for us to continue that scholarship uh, in our community. So we continue to grow. Um, let's kind of shift the conversation a little bit. Uh, some big things are happening here in the state of Georgia. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand on Tuesday, the president will be here uh, to talk mm -hmm. about voting rights. And tomorrow, right. uh, there's a sentencing hearing down in Brunswick that I will be at for uh, our dear brother, um, Ahmaud Arbery's, um, the ending of the Brian McMichael trial with the sentencing. Again, you were part of fighting for voting rights with Park Cannon. Uh, you were part of uh, the push uh, to, to indict and convict um, Travis and Greg McMichael and William Roddy Bryant. What do you see as, as the continuation of all of that uh, as we move into 2022? I, I think voting rights is one of the biggest things that we have to focus on, but it's not just for the surface reasons that people think. First of all, they pull the jury rolls from the voter rolls. <laughs> Let's start with that. And you taught me that. Mm -hmm. They pull, they pull the, they pull the, the jury rolls from the voter rolls. So if we are not in these jewelry boxes, in these jury boxes, giving fair and equal sentences, punishments, all of that to the to people, good or bad. You know what I mean? Whether it's preventing over sentencing of a 15 year old African American male, or whether it's making sure that a the killers like the McMichaels get their just due, 
we have to be in these jury pools. And the first way to, for us to, you know, the way in which we get into these jury pools are by getting on the voter rolls. So we have to, we have to make it so that people can register to vote. And we have to make it less complicated for people. I mean, to vote is your your right in this country. Why, why are we why are we trying to put our restrictions on it like it's entrance into the hottest club? Like everybody gets a vote. Yeah. I feel like if you're an American citizen, I feel like if you do the censorship, if you get a driver's license, it should just automatically register you to vote. Period. Point blank. Absolutely. Move on. It should not be that difficult to vote. You should not have to come up with 57 pieces of ID, stand outside for 30 days and 60 nights, prove your address, move around. Like all of that is crazy. As as advanced as we are in the digital in the digital space, I should almost be able to go to any voter poll and vote. I should be able to see vote here, pull up, vote, and leave. Mm-hmm. And so it's like this idea that they're working so hard to keep us from vote should be the first red flag at, of its importance. Like, if it's not that important, why are you working so hard to keep me from doing it? it? Must be important. Because why is it important? Specifically at the local level, which is why we've been fighting. You know, we there's a national bill that we need to pass. But why we've been fighting so hard at the local level is because we also need to teach people about civic engagement, because guess what? I can't go down there to the White House and get past the front nothing to have a conversation with anybody, to get in a meeting, to talk to anybody. But I tell you what I can do right here in Georgia. I could show up at every meeting. I could participate in my MPU. I can I can I can get on these Zoom calls. I can organize. I, I tell people this all the time. I have seen. When people think about lobbying, they think that you have to spend a whole lot of money to lobby. I have seen grassroots lobbying in the state of Georgia be successful. I've seen rape laws change because of grassroots lobbying. I've seen ordinances get passed because of grassroots lobbying. And so we have to teach people that really, if you really attack your local level, so state, city, county levels, you really are powerful. You are exceptionally powerful. And they realized that when we shifted the narrative here in Georgia, that's why their reaction to that is like, oh, we gotta, we gotta stop them from voting. We gotta stop them from voting because they're doing too much. They're elect and they're electing people through this voting. Not only are they getting things done, but now they're electing people that's one of them. And those people are coming in like a park cannon and being a disruptor. <laughs> yeah, and get, getting stuff done. Yeah, and so that's why I think it's so important. You touched on some real important stuff there. You know, you can't uh, serve on a jury panel, and many people were complaining, including myself, of the jury panel in Brunswick uh, that that handed down the the conviction of the McMichaels and and uh, and William Roddy Bryant. But if you weren't registered to vote, you would not be a part of the the people selected for that trial or the federal trial that's coming up, which will be broader than just Glenn County. So if you live in the Southern District of Georgia, you have an opportunity to serve on that jury and to be fair. It's just like she said, we can't have criminal justice reform if you're not a part of the jury. And so I think that's important, but she really hit on this most important piece. You know, we lobby all the time here in the state of Georgia uh, on Monday, uh, state legislature will take back in session. It will be the first day of 40 days of session on Monday here in Georgia, which every citizen of the state has an opportunity to go down and talk with their elected officials. Hopefully you'll do it masked and socially distant, but go talk to them as we're going to be making big decisions on education and health care and voting rights and gun laws now and so many others. So it's important that we are active and, and in place. Go to your town halls. Go to your halls of legislature and make your voice heard. Make sure you email and you write. All these things are ways of lobbying. You don't need a lobby group. You're the lobbying for yourself and your neighborhood. Be a part of your neighborhood um, committees like the MPUs here in the city of Atlanta. And we'll give you another example that lobbying and voting works. We elected a new mayor in the city of Atlanta. We got a man named Dre. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought? In Atlanta, we have a man named Keisha and then a man named Drake. 
<laughs> so that is why it's important. And we're also going to hold him accountable. Y'all know good and well, I held Keisha accountable. So right. we're going to hold Andre accountable as well. But it's important that we participate. And that's why I bring you guests um, like this on the platform. They can give you, they can just break it down. And so in breaking it down, let's talk about the next steps for the TPU, the People's Uprising. Tell mm -hmm. us what's next on the horizon. I saw the rebrand. I'm super excited. What's next for the TPU? Well, you know, one of the things that we talked about when we started our rebrand was that we wanted to be productive and we wanted to do tangible things where people could see the change and then want to be a part of the change. And so we thought for this year, let's think of three big things that we want to tackle and really wrap our head around those big three things and tackle them. And one was voting rights. Um, the other was food insecurity. And then the third thing that we wanted to tackle um, was um, the wealth gap. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at initiatives that we could put together, programming that we put together, we could put together that would help with that. And so one of the things that we noticed in the, even in the mayoral election was there was a very low turnout from young people. Young people were not engaged. Um, young people were not excited. As usual, our seniors showed up because our seniors don't play with play no games about their freedoms and they're going to show up every time. They're going to be well versed as to who they're voting for, why they're voting for them, what the ordinances are, all of that stuff. When they show up to vote, they know what's happening. Um, but we were like, okay, young people did not show up. We need to put together initiatives that are going to engage young people in voting and break it down the same way you and I are having this conversation and make them realize the importance and the significance, not just of voting at the national level, but why it's even more important in some ways that they vote at the local level. So we're organizing concerts, black parties, all of these things centered around getting youth engagement when it comes to voting. Um, when it came to the wealth gap, we looked, we Again, I'm always a person. I'm like, y'all has got to mix a little bit of old with a little bit of the new, and that's how you're going to win. So we said, who successfully was combating the wealth gap? Well, we looked back and we, 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 we Maynard, <laughs> like here in Atlanta, Maynard, Maynard was the one who managed that wealth gap and who managed it well. And so we looked at, looked back and looked at his platform and some of the things that he put in place and, and, and some of his, you know, speeches and stuff and what it was that was important to him. And for me personally, when I started reading up on him and researching him, I knew him, but I started dig digging really deep on Maynard. What I realized is that Maynard understood the importance of trade education. That was very important to him. Mm -hmm. It was very, very important to him. And he also really was an ally to having vocational education in high schools. Hmm. That also was something that he happily funded, was super excited about, saw the significance in it, felt like it was important. And when you look at the, the, the wage, the wealth gap during his, during his run, what you noticed was that, yes, obviously due to systemic racism, white, Black people still were not making the same as their white counterparts, but the gap was a lot closer then than it is now. Mm -hmm. The other thing is home ownership in the black community was way higher during that time than it is now. And it's like, how are people building their lives and able to afford housing in the city? Well, they, they were skilled tradesmen. They were plumbers, electricians, carpenters, cosmetologists, which led a lot of them into entrepreneurship because they would be, you know, she, your auntie would have a, a work at a beauty salon only for a little while before she would have her own beauty shop. Mm -hmm. Your uncle would work for a construction company only for a little while until he had his own carpentry business that just got, you know, that did that did business with larger construction sites. And so when we looked at what's happening, we had this huge wave where we told everybody that they needed to go to college and flooded the job pool. And now people can't get jobs, but they got $100,000 in student loan debt. Hmm. And this is not to say that I don't appreciate higher education because I went to college. So I do appreciate higher education. But what I'm saying is we're looking at a gap in tradesmanship and I did I, was, I went through some research papers and realized that over it was I think the number they said was 
close to um, 200,000 jobs in the state of Georgia go unfilled every year due to lack of certifications. Hmm. That people don't have the cert the basic like basic nine months, six month, three month school certifications to get these jobs that pay fifty thousand dollars or better. Hmm. And then Microsoft moved in, and we were like, "There's all these IT help test jobs that you can get with a mere certification that people don't even know is available to them." And so one of the things that we're doing this year that we're most excited about is we're doing a large scale, just like you used to go to the big college fairs. We're doing a large scale trade school fair where, and we are going to work in conjunction with um, TANF and other programs that are. Um, letting people know that they need to move on with their employment. We are working with organizations that will be able to offer scholarships um, to some of the people to cover it. But most trade schools are not an absorbent amount of money. And a lot of people who have not gone to college, who are not college educated, have not tapped into any of their available federal Pell Grant money that they can actually use to go to trade schools. And they don't know that part. They see a trucking school and it costs them $5,000. They say, I ain't got $5,000, but you're eligible for a, pay, a go to FAFS for just like everybody else and get that Pell Grant and get it completely covered. Graduate from school debt-free with a trade that's going to make you $20 an hour. That's awesome. And so a lot of people are missing those, those gaps. And even in terms of us not teaching people about civics, there are government contracts that you could get with these kind of trade skills that if you had them, not only would you have your regular business, but you could have a government contract that could be worth valued anywhere from 50 to half a million dollars. And so we're trying to bridge the gap on that. And the final thing that we wanted to focus on that we thought was really important was food insecurity. We had conversations with a lot of black farmers who were talking about how difficult it was for them to get into a lot of these big um, farmers markets. Like, and they were saying how a lot of times you think at these farmers markets that it's all because it is organic and homegrown and you're thinking, oh, this is just the local regular everyday farmer bringing this stuff. Sometimes it's the dole, the, the dole corporation who have subcontracted this person to grow pineapples and now they're at the farmer's market and you thinking it's just Bobo Joe who bought some land in Conyers, Georgia. And it's really not. It's a subsidiary of this larger conglomerate. And there's not that many spaces at these farmer's markets. So they were saying they're having difficulty getting into these farmer's markets. So we thought, what better way to, be, to bridge that gap than to say, okay, let's do pop-up farmer's markets in food deserts where there is no grocery stores and let's work with the city to be able to allow the farmers to take SNAP and, and um, food stamp benefits and let's get fresh, healthy produce to marginalize people in their community by black farmers and give black farmers a space to actually sell their produce. Now that's an excellent idea. And, and that's why, again, I'm so proud of the TPU uh, because you know organizers at heart always see a problem and they find a way to fix the problem. And, and that idea right there um, is worth its weight in, in gold to, to underserved, marginalized communities. So I'm just proud of that. And of course, I'm gonna I'm a be there and help in any way I can. Bagging food and helping people. <laughs> yes, especially, especially in the underserved communities. So um, yeah. Kim, this has been an awesome conversation. I, I just love every time we get together because I learn so much um, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to open this platform up to you. I uh, want you to give some parting words to, uh, to my followers and to all those listening uh, on the World Wide Web uh, of how they can be a part of this fight and, and how they can stay encouraged as we move forward. I would say, first of all, I know it don't feel like it, y'all, but we really are winning. I know it doesn't feel like that. It feels like the days get darker and darker, but we really are winning. We really are cracking the ceiling um, on the glass ceilings. And for the first time, we are in a position where we can unapologetically holds people accountable. Now we're not gonna win every fight and we're not gonna win every race, but it, but there was a time when it was a threat to our physical being to even attempt to hold people accountable. And so strides have been made and we're pushing the engine forward. And the other thing I wanna, I wanna say to people is the greatest trick that the white supremacist delusion has ever played on us to, is to convince us that we were powerless. 
to convince us that the work we do don't doesn't matter. I just I, I saw circulating on the internet on the internet recently. Harvard did a study to show that protests actually do make a difference and actually does affect change at every level um, from from the legislative level all the way to just the just the the corporate um, cultures that it has an effect. And so that is why what I want people to really feel is empowered and really understand that we all don't have to do the same thing in this fight. If you are a kindergarten teacher and the way that which you feel empowered is that you have a black history coloring book that you bring in every year and you're able to give these kids some additional education, you are doing the work. If you are a person who owns a fruit stand and you have found 10 kids in your neighborhood who go without food on the weekends when they're not at school and you pack up bags for them and tell on Friday when they walk in past your fruit stand on school, you give each of them a bag, you are doing the work. Every little bit helps. And I'll, and I'll leave y'all with this. When I have, I have ADHD, and I went undiagnosed my entire academic career without ADHD, I, with, without getting diagnosed with ADHD. I was an adult when I was diagnosed. And I had a teacher, she was both my seventh and eighth grade teacher, Miss Carolyn Lumpkin. And what she realized in that moment was that I wasn't a bad kid, like the label that I had been given, but that I was a kid who needed to, to talk. So she realized if she would just let me talk, then I would be calm after that and I would be fine for the rest of the day. So whenever I would come in and I would be having an ADHD episode, she would say, Kim, do you have a lesson that you want to, do you want to teach today? Because she would know that my, 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 I spend a lot of time at the library on the weekends. And she would say, do you have a lesson that you want to teach today? Because I see you in a talking mood. And I would say, yes, actually, I do have a lesson I want to teach today. And she would say, okay, you got 20 minutes to teach your lesson and you got to sit down and calm down. And often two to three times a week, I would teach black history from what I had been learning from the Carter G. Woodson library or from my after school programs for 20 to 30 minutes every day or, or two, for 20 to 30 minutes, several times a week in that class, all of seventh grade and all of eighth grade. So when people say I'm a powerful speaker, what I want to tell them is somebody gave me space to learn that. So Ms. Lumpkin may not know her piece in the movement, but her piece in the movement was me. Wow. Was giving me space to master speaking in front of a group of people fearlessly. Wow. So everything that you do matters. Wow. Shout out to Ms. Lumpkin. Um, I, we, we owe you tremendously uh, for empowering uh, this, this young person who's now, uh, you know, a powerhouse in and of herself to give her voice and space. And so I think with that, you know, I want to leave you guys with this message. You know, the message is this protest works. It's always worked. And as Kim said, the biggest deception uh, that's been played upon us is the to fool us into believing that there's no power in the people when all power is in the people. And when the people organize and when the people convene, power happens. And so as we move into 2022 and as we see even greater mountains that we have to say be removed and cast into the sea, or we have to say that we're going to overcome, always remember that there's some young person listening to you or looking at you that you can empower. And that's the purpose of this platform so that whether we talk to 10 people or 10,000 people, we inspire them to be greater than they ever thought they could be. You know, I have had teachers in my career um, that helped me get to where I am. The greatest one is my mother who taught me ever since I could walk. And what she always told me, Gerald, is that no matter what you do, make sure you do it the best you can because you never know who's watching. Well, I'm gonna add something to, do it, to that. Do it the best you can because it doesn't matter who's watching, that you are trying to make change today for those that are coming. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, allow Kim to let y'all know how y'all can follow her and get connected with her uh, for the next events in the movement. How can people follow you and stay connected? 
Well, the best way to follow me is Instagram and TikTok. And it's the same handle on both. Uh, it's just my name, Kimberly Latrice Jones, K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y. L-A-T-R-I-C-E-J-O-N-E-S. I just put my middle name in there because there's a lot of Kimberly Joneses in the world. Uh, so I'm Kimberly Jones on both Instagram and TikTok. I'm Kim Latrice Jones on Twitter and on Facebook. It is I am Kimberly Latrice, but the one place you can go and find all of that, find the handles, find the books, find information about TPU, all of that is on my website, which is just www.kimjoneswrites, W-R-I-T-E-S dot com. Well, everybody go check out Kim on all platforms, go to her website, make sure you buy her books, but make sure you stay focused on the movement. We'll be down in Brunswick tomorrow. Uh, the president will be here on Tuesday and we're going to continue to push forward for justice and liberation for all and make sure that we center the voices of the most marginalized. This is attorney Gerald Griggs here on Justice Media. This is the Justice Fighter podcast. You can find us on all streaming platforms and do us a favor, share the podcast because you will learn something and you will be connected to the movement for justice, liberation, and learn all things about social justice, civil rights, and the law. I'm attorney Gerald Griggs, and I will see you on the next podcast. This is the Justice Fighter Podcast, Justice Fighter Podcast. with attorney Gerald Griggs. Attorney G. Well, we have conversations on social justice, civil rights, and political news that affects us all. Let Attorney Griggs put you on game. Only on the Justice Fighter Podcast, y'all.